Well, good evening, um, all of those who are attending. This is the Monday, July 29th, 2024 meeting of the Historical Commission. And um, this is a Zoom meeting. We are uh, meeting remotely and I believe the um, meeting is being recorded. I see a note about that, I never left my screen. Um, before we begin the meeting, we would all, uh, like to entertain any uh, public comment about any items that are not on the agenda. If anybody has anything they would like to um, speak about, uh, please uh, tell us who you are and where you live. Um, um, Janet Gross. Hi, uh, Janet. And you can hear me today? We can hear you today. Excellent, I do. excellent. Uh, 32 Round Hill Road. And I will begin. <clears throat> Admittedly, I rarely look at property transfers in the Gazette, but back in March or April, a Northampton listing caught my attention, particularly what seems to be, maybe, going on at 88 and 94 Crescent. If you recall, the property at 88 Crescent was once the second home of the gymnasium of the Round Hill School for Boys, and Mr. George of George Propane, who had recently purchased the property, sought to demolish the former gymnasium and build a new house closer to Crescent Street. This occurred in late 2022 or early 2023. At that time, the Historical Commission issued a demolition delay, and yes, Theodore Paradise was then a next door neighbor at 94 Crescent. Haven't the slightest idea why the two decided to exchange properties, but I remain concerned about 88 Crescent. Has the demolition delay expired? And is the new owner now free to demolish it as at will? Last time I looked, the building still stood. You may recall that Rogers Hall, a property of the former Clark School and once home to the former Round Hill School for Boys and later to the Water Cure, treatment and hotel was destroyed by the raging conflagration of 2016, never rebuilt and now virtually forgotten. And yes, it's a concern that the city of Northampton seems to have no interest in the former Round Hill School for Boys, 1823 to 1834, though its innovative educational endeavors were often imitated and very much to the credit of George Bancroft and Joseph Cogswell, extremely well-educated men who went on to quite different though distinguished careers. Cogswell as librarian of the Astor Library, whose collection became the foundation of New York City's public library, and Bancroft, historian, secretary of the Navy, founder of the U.S. Naval Academy, diplomat, diplomat and congressional eulogist for Abraham Lincoln. Needless to say, the Springfield gang who currently own the development where the Round Hill schools once stood couldn't care less about the school or education in general, and even had a history prepared for their Clark School Historic District that significantly destroyed, distorts the truth of the property's early and later years. Although its existence was brief, Round Hill alumni often went on to notable careers. A number were Unitarian ministers, abolitionists, philanthropists, diplomats, historians, opium traders. George Cheney Shattuck founded St. Paul's School where Round Hill's philosophy formed the basis of the curriculum. Nathaniel Shurtleff was a mayor of Boston, Josiah Whitney of, New Ham of Northampton, a prominent geologist, Ellery Channing poet, John Murray Forbes, opium trader, philanthropist, founder of the modern Milton Academy, and nephew of Northampton's Anne Jean Lyman. Not to overlook Anne Jean's son, Joseph, an alum of the school and prominent abolitionist, or her second son, Edward H.R. Lyman, who donated the Lyman Plant House to Smith College in honor of his mother, as well as the Academy of Music to Northampton, and who as a child nearly lost his fingers to an overzealous punitive schoolmaster in marked contrast to the humane treatment he would later experience at the Round Hill School. 
1864, Robert Trail Spence Lowell, clergyman, headmaster of St. Mark's School, and great-grandfather of distinguished American poet Robert Lowell, dedicated a volume of poetry to his fondly remembered teacher, Joseph Green Cogswell, the first head of Round Hill School, to whom the boy brought his lessons with such reverence and love and without fear, no one would ever ha hammer his knuckles with a ruler at the school. The man now offers this book as fearlessly and with no less love and reverence. It is long past time for Northampton to recognize and honor the Round Hill School for Boys and its contributions both to the city's history and to that of American education, both academic and gymnastic. Although I long suspected the gymnasium at 88 Crescent would vanish into oblivion on June 24th, the date of the last historical commission meeting, I learned that Mr. Paradise is in fact rehabilitating the former gymnasium. Wonderful news indeed that I hope you will celebrate. Yet I still recommend a historically impeccable plaque at the locale of the former school on Round Hill Road, a significant memorial prepared at the expense of the development, as well as one of the, at the former gymnasium prepared by the city. Tokens of Northampton's recognition, respect for, and appreciation of its past. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I hope that um, you can share your research and excellent writing, um, perhaps with the folks at the Forbes, so that they have a record of this, um, because it's really so comprehensive and um, we appreciate all the time that you put into this. So, and- um, Happy to do that, thank you. Yeah, and also I think the idea of the, um, some kind of a, a commemorative something, a plaque or whatever is a great idea. So we'll put that in the minutes and um, bring it up for consideration at some point in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the audience that would like to say anything? Okay, I don't see any hands. Um, we have a very brief chairs report tonight, uh, just to update those of you who um, uh, we saw Steve Strymer at the last meeting um, talking about the proposed National Register District for the abolition and reform area of Florence. Um, Sarah and I um, and Michael has volunteered to, to work through um, that uh, nomination with the Mass Historical Commission and the consultants um, that are working on it. Uh, they've run into a bit of a snag on it, um, but I think we're confident that it will eventually happen. It just may not be in the original form that was uh, imagined, but we will keep everyone posted on that and just to know that uh, we are working on it. Okay, we have a, um, a set of minutes from May uh, 13th. And um, if anybody has any comments on that or does not have any comments on that, I would entertain a motion to approve them. Any comments from anybody? Okay. No, I, I thought they looked fine. I would uh, move to approve them as written. Second. Second. Um, I I just wanted to point out, Sarah, there are a couple of typos in this. You just want to maybe want to check it um, if you need me to locate them for you. I, th I think your um, spell check will probably pick them up before I get to you, though. So. Okay. I will double check those. Make okay. Those so, um, if there are no other comments, uh, we'll have a vote. All right. Roll call vote. Barbara? Yes. Michael? Yes. Dylan? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. All right, we have two public hearings tonight, or I'm sorry, three. Um, one of them is informational, uh, and we're gonna do that one first. That is the bus shelters within the Elm Street right of way um, at Elm Street and Franklin Street. And I'm hoping that there's someone um, who charged this project here to talk to us about. Am I right about that? 
Yes, oh, Keith. Uh, right. Keith from the planning right. department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Keith, we all received the information about the models of bus shelters. Um, if, but if you have any uh, any kind of presentation, or you'd like to just give us a brief few words on it, um, sure. That would be great. Um, I can just talk a little bit. Of we are not issuing a certificate of appropriateness or, or otherwise on this. This is more um, for us to provide feedback because these shelters are going in the public right of way. So we do not have pur purview over that. Okay, Keith. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I can just kind of talk briefly about the uh, project. And if people want, I can also pull up the images again, not the dimensions and everything else. They're, they're about 11 by, um, the, by five. Uh, but the purpose of the project, um, we have a grant to install some bus shelters uh, in this space. It seems appropriate uh, on Franklin Street. We do have a um, housing for recently homeless individuals that are severely medically compromised. Some of them, um, several of them have mobility issues and they utilize public transportation. Uh, this seemed like a very natural fit. Um, so as Janet said, um, these shelters would be going in the public right away, just like any other shelter. Um, and they will be paying for the shelter itself, not just the um, construction of the pad. Um, and so there's two, there is the Victorian, which has more of a, a metal roof, kind of a solid structure. Um, and then the, what they're calling the contemporary, which is, um, you know, glass. Um, so love to hear your feedback. If, if one of those is more preferential, um, it, you know, uh, there's not, um, uh, don't need your, um, your vote. Um, if there is no consensus, um, but love to hear some feedback, um, and hopefully the construction will be going um, by the end of the year. Um, it's, it's you know it's really just pouring some concrete and then bolting in the shelter. Um, it's kind of an overview of the, of the, but does anyone need to see the see the images? I can pull them up pretty easy. I think that would be very helpful, Keith. Sure. Okay. And while go. you're doing that, um, I did have one question. Um, there are other bus shelters on Elm, correct? Uh, yes, I mean, there's bus shelters on Elm. <laughs> and are there is there a certain style of those uh, that is consistent, or is it kind of a I a national thing? I believe the one by the high school is kind of like this one, which they're calling Victorian. Um, but I'd have to double check. Um, yeah. So this is the Victorian one. Oh, no, um, there's also one at Smith College too, right in front of John and Green Hall. Okay. Yeah. I I don't know the um. The okay. Answer. Has there been any input from neighbors at this point? Uh, no, not at this point. And is this going, are these going um is this going uh facing Elm, facing Franklin, um just at the intersection? Uh, uh so on on the north side of the road, so it'll be just past Franklin on Elm. Um mm -hmm. and so the opening will be facing towards Elm. And then on the south side of Elm Street, it would be past Harrison. Um, also kind of facing the road, the opening facing the road. Okay. And there's um, it, there's a clear distance of, I think it's maybe 60 feet that it has to go past the intersection, um, but generally more safe past the intersection. And the, the one in front of John M. Green is the Victorian style. And I can share a, an image of that once Keith is done, so people want to see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, that just, yeah, so particularly, oh, sorry, Ron. No, particularly yeah, if two if two others on Elm Street are already like this one, um, in some ways, even if they weren't, I really prefer this one just because mm -hmm. I feel that being dark, it just I don't know, it seems to blend in more, not be as um, um, as stark or you know the 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 light of aluminum or I'm sure it's not aluminum, but the metal of the other one. 
So I would, I know we don't have, um, we don't vote on it, but I, I think um, I prefer this style, particularly if the other two are already in this style. Makes sense. Dylan, do you have any comments? No, I agree with, with what Barbara said. It looks like the one in front of the high school is somewhat similar, dark, dark black metal. Um, I don't see some of the details, but um, yeah. Michael, any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, I think the, uh, I think the, uh, in addition to the color, the shape of the roof works a little bit better. Yeah, I like that. I think it works better with um, the look on Elm and obviously um, conforming to the other shelters. It gives it continuity to the passage down the street. So I, I would definitely lean that direction. Okay. And I, I agree with everybody. I think this is the right choice. So um, hopefully that will work out for you and we'll look forward to um, seeing them in place and maybe right. using them. And, and oh. Keith, can I recommend if you do any other presentations, you might grab that image from in front of Smith because I think it's a much better presentation of what the shelter is going to look like in context. Yeah, okay. um, yeah I think that'll help. All right. Uh, I can do that, and I will definitely um, take this as a vote of confidence for the Victorian. So, appreciate Great. it. Yeah, thank you. We're glad to be of help. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next public hearing is um, a request for a local historic district certificate of appropriateness pursuant to section 195 of the New Hampton Code for parking space creation at St. John Episcopal Church at 48 Elm, that's parcel 31D-101. Um, we did receive a uh, letter and, or I should say description of the proposed work and images. Um, and do we have, um, is it David here? To okay. yeah. Welcome. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, do you have do you have a presentation you would like to give to us? Yeah, I do. I have a, a PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation. Um, Perfect. Wanted to and uh, presume I can go ahead now if you let me share. Uh, I just wanted to say that I'm I'm a uh, one of several volunteers and members of St. John's who are here on this call. Uh, and along with uh, Karen Danu, uh, who's also on the call. I'm a, a co-chair of the building committee, uh, helping to manage the building as a volunteer. And we also have Catherine Lindbergh, um, who is our archivist and historian, too. Uh, and I'm hoping we will be joined by Richard Jeske, who is a member of the board. Um, but let me go ahead and I'll, I'll see if I can launch my, oops, well one, sorry. Um, so. While you're doing that, uh, just commissioners, um, I'll have David give his presentation and then uh, I'll explain to everybody the criteria by which we would um, review this, which are uh, criteria, criteria be, are outlined in the, um, the Elmstreet Historic District Standards. So, so you don't have to look them up okay. or reread what was in the staff report. I will uh, state them. Okay. So I, please tell me if you can't hear me, but uh, first, just uh, to make it clear, and I think everyone on this call probably knows where St. John's Episcopal Church is at 48 Elm Street, I'm surrounded by Smith College. Uh, and here's a, a, a close up uh, showing some of the surrounding properties uh, right along uh, Route 9 or, or Elm Street. Uh, we have the, the facade building constructed in um, 1893, opened that year construction finished that year. Um, very historic building. Uh, it's one that we're quite proud of, uh, although it is a challenge to keep it um, operating well and uh, without roof leaks, etc. Um, but one of the many things we've done over the years is uh, we've hosted uh, the MANA soup kitchen program. In fact, we created it back in 1985, and it has grown enormously. You can see the graphic in the lower right uh, showing the number of meals per week that the MANA Soup Kitchen Program provides, both to uh, those who are food insecure, homeless, who come right to our site, and many are, are delivered as well. 
And and in around um, 2020 or shortly before, uh, a lot of changes occurred. Uh, that some of which were described in the the narrative uh, that I think you all have. Uh, but one, of course, is COVID and the need for um, uh, more um, housing and uh, a warming center, uh, which we also created uh, within St. John's building. Um, this has created, though, uh, a huge amount of pressure, uh, partly for uh, space, but in particular for parking. And that's what this is all about. David? So David, I'm just going to interrupt you. I don't think that you're advancing your slides, so probably the way you had planned to. Okay. Right. We are still on the first slide. All right. Okay. Let me see if I can start now. Stop you mentioned the, the graph, and I will go ahead. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Try this again. Uh, so here we go. I will share. Um, okay. Now, if I go back to the slide four, can you see it? There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to try to go to slideshow mode again, but maybe maybe that was the problem. But let me try it again. Tell me, please tell me if it doesn't advance. Okay. So this is an image just showing uh, the Mana Soup Kitchen uh, as it exists, as, uh, serving food at St. John's, uh, and um, it's centered at St. John's, headquartered there, and we have a, a lot of traffic in and out. That has just grown exponentially since around 2019, 2020, and we're struggling to meet that need right now. Okay, I'm going to advance to the next one. Do you see this next one? No, David, no. I, I, I think it didn't go into slideshow mode, but if you click in the left hand column on number five, we'll be able to see the slide. Okay. There you go. Okay, there we go. All right, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll stay in this mode. This is, is yeah, this okay. That's fine. You can see it. All right. So what happened at that point was uh, the the program grew enormously because of the need in, in the town. Uh, you know, and the need is reflected in the uh, efforts to create a resilience hub. And a lot of the functions that a resilience hub will ultimately have, uh, we're providing from St. John's, um, partly because of our location, but because of the history. But what also happened was we had uh, this tremendous gridlock of vehicles um, and vehicles that are needed by uh, those who are uh, food insecure and uh, use their, their vehicles for transportation, but also uh, for those who are doing deliveries of food. And there just simply is not enough on-street parking in front to accommodate the need. And so we it created a bit of gridlock and you can see the facade in the church here in the lower left and vehicles packed in to the point where uh, you, 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 were, you were locked in, you couldn't get out. <laughs> uh, and it was dangerous because uh, we wouldn't have really very good emergency vehicle access. Uh, the cars were blocking access to the front of the church. Um, it was blocking the view of the facade even. And so we realized that this is not just not simply not gonna work um, so our temporary solution, and again, I hope you can see this slide, uh, is uh, you can see the the half circle driveway that we've had in front of the church, I believe, since the very beginning, 1893. Uh, what we've done here is we've only allowed uh, three parking spaces uh, along the um, that semicircle, uh, and I don't know if you can see my my pointer. Um, and then we decided that we would in, uh, prohibit any other vehicles from going through. We also changed the direction of the flow and allowed those extra vehicles to park on the left-hand side as you're facing the church, left-hand side of the main driveway. We also have a, um, a handicap spot here too, and a five minute spot. And this was a temporary to see if this could possibly work and uh, meet the needs of the MANA program the church and um, and relieve that congestion and the and the other risks that we worry about. Um, and you can see from this Google Earth view uh, what it looked like it looks like now. Uh, although we made a few changes, but you can see the five vehicles here along the side of the church. You also see this the Smith Art Museum here, on, just a little to the lower right, uh, and this is the church to the upper left. So. Um, here's the facade now. <laughs> uh, this was just, in fact, taken a, a few hours ago. 
uh, and re recognizing that we now have great access, uh, we have also a great visibility to our, what we think of as a very beautiful entryway um, to the building. However, uh, this was just a temporary solution. We recognize that. And we have since recognized that the surface that uh, the cars have been parking on uh, become, has become degraded. And we expected that. Uh, it collects water. It's very um, packed, hard packed soil. Um, it also, in addition to that problem, has a, maybe an even a more serious issue with the edge of the pavement becoming undermined and degraded. Uh, and we're at the point at which our, our pavement experts, and, and Richard Jessicke is one, are telling us that it's going to start crumbling and we'll have to repave uh, that entire stretch uh, unless we do something. And the solution that uh, the experts have told us that we, we need to look to is uh, paving this space if we're going to um, solve this problem, at least. Um, and so what we did is we looked at uh, options and how much space would be required. We surveyed some of the local angled uh, parking spaces in the historic district downtown and nearby. Uh, and looked at what, what the dimensions are in keeping with the, the surrounding areas. We proposed a, a dimension and angle space that looks like this, about 55 to 60 degree angle with a length of 19 feet and width of 10 and a half feet. Uh, and if we had five of them on the side of the building um, where we were allowing the on um, grass parking or on mud parking right now, that would cover about a, a thousand square foot area. Um, so this is the proposal we're looking at. Uh, once again, the church is here. Um, the, the facade, the front is right over here with still the possibility of three parking spaces, one of which we normally reserve for the minister and one for the administration, administrative assistant. Um, and then the five spaces for largely for the MANA program uh, would be to the left uh, uh, as you're facing the front of the church. And we have the, we've had the tent there for, for many years. You've all probably seen that as well. Um, so what would that look like? Uh, and uh, here is a, just a little few images uh, to recognize that there have been a lot of changes over the years. The, the upper right picture is one from around 1905 of the church, uh, well before the Smith Art Museum was constructed. And you could see the entire side of the church at that point, uh, including the parish house. Everything was quite visible. Now on the lower left side, and that's a picture I just snapped a few hours ago, uh, showing the, the art museum, which obscures most of that side of the building. Um, but um, you can still see some of the, the parking that's there. And of course, the tent is quite visible. Um, another thing that we've done, uh, and this was also taken just a few hours ago, uh, is we've um, built a, a raised bed, a, what we're calling a snacking garden, uh, with um, beans and uh, cherry tomatoes, et cetera, uh, for the, again, for the food insecure who can snap, who can uh, nibble on fresh um, vegetables. Uh, and that is in itself helping to, uh, to mask uh, the, the parking area, as well as the marquee on the left-hand side of the here. Um, and so there's a lot more to this. You've got quite a bit in the document that uh, we sent you, but this is just a, a quick a couple minute run through and very happy to elaborate on any of these points and answer questions. Okay, um, thank you, David. That was great to um, see that uh, presented on screen. So I, just before we uh, ask questions and take comments, I just wanted to remind um, everyone, commissioners, um, what the guidelines are recommending uh, for the district in regards to parking. Um, obviously, uh, parking um, is at stake so clearly in this that older buildings were not designed with parking in mind, uh, especially you know, a church that was built in the 19th century. So um, this is a modern um, addition. Um, the things that we need to be considering are uh, 
specifically this. Um, one is that the guidelines do not recommend that front yards or entryways be converted to parking areas um, because the vehicles do dominate the view of the structure from the public way, and that's not something that we'd like to encourage. Um, however, landscaping can be integrated into the parking. So when they say landscaping, um, I think we're talking about probably mostly planting, possibly fencing, some kind of a um, a softening effect that would um, soften the visual impact of the parking area. Um, the parking must be on a designated stabilized area and of course conform to the Northampton's parking uh, zoning, excuse me, zoning regulations. And that was one thing I, I did have a question about. So but I will leave it to um, the other commissioners to ask questions of David before we um, deliberate. Anybody? Um, I, th I think that, um, you know, it's wonderful that, that, that St. John's has stepped up in so many ways with MANA for so many years and now with other things. And um, it occurs to me that once the city's resilience hub opens, I don't know how, I mean, that could be a ways off, that you might not need these spaces, or though, although they might still be very useful to you. And um, I even though the um, our guidelines for um, Elm Street District certainly discourage having parking in a location such as this in relation to a building, I think that with the um, with the landscape screening, which you could add more, as because obviously a garden is seasonal, so that won't look green like that all all year. That that would help to shield it, and I feel as if um, it's. Uh, it's also, I mean, blacktop is always reversible. I mean, it's not easy, but if you decided later on you didn't need this extra parking, um, uh, blacktop can be removed and things can be reseeded. You know, you could have more lawn back there, but um, I think it, it seems like the, um, in order for you to, um, in some ways function and serve these um, other functions other than being a church for your, um, uh, members, um, I don't. I would not object to. Um, I, I think this is a reasonable solution to to pave that, um, providing maybe there's a little more um, uh, more permanent screening of some kind. And as Martha said, it could be a fence as well as as more greenery. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. We we've discussed this a little bit and. Uh... It certainly would uh, defer to the experts as to what what you think would be would be best in this case. Great, um, uh, Dylan or Michael, any question, comments? Well, St. John's has done such great things for the community, as others have said, for decades. Um, it's so. It's, so challenged by its positioning surrounded on all sides by smith there isn't i remember when other issues came before us as at the historic commission that we went over the property in depth and certainly growing up on elm street i know it very well um so it doesn't seem like there are a lot of other options here um historically i i feel like i've seen a photo maybe here at forbes that shows you know 1930s or 1940s even gravel over on that side i'm not suggesting that that's a solution to this but there obviously has been a need for a long time um for some sort of flexibility in this in this area so yeah with the same provisions that barbara said um i i don't think that there's a lot of other options and i think the need is pretty clear so i would certainly be flexible michael um, I was wondering, um, David, could you give me a, a, a better sense of how the parking spaces are used? Like what specifically, those five spaces, like specifically, how do people use them? Well, uh, typically what happens is it's a, it's a mix, uh, as I said, of uh, guests, uh, those who are coming for meals to eat on site at St. John's. And uh, also those who are picking up meals to deliver to others in the community. Mm. Uh, and so there, those who are eating there will maybe stay there for you know, 45 minutes. Those who are just picking up 
food or are there in and out pretty quickly. And and would you designate one of those spots for pickups? It seems to me that pickups would be kind of a priority in some sense, always having a, a, a spot open for yeah. that. We, we do have a spot straight ahead uh, for a, fi a five minute spot. I see. Um, as I say, that that's um, often for very heavy loads of, for example, food coming in or some equipment that comes in and out uh, mm -hmm. to um, serve the kitchen in some way. Uh, so they, uh, the lighter um, cargo um, tasks are, are usually delegated to the, the angle spaces. And then your your feeling is that if you have those spaces, it the circle will be cleared out and accessible, and yeah. passage will yeah. always be available. So right. there won't be any. Okay. Right. That's been our. This is why we we did ran this experiment starting in August of last year, uh, where we uh, allowed um, those who were. Um, involved with MANA, serving MANA, or, or clients in MANA, uh, guests to park in that area just to the left uh, that I showed you. Uh, up until that point, we didn't allow it. And once we did, and we made it very clear to everyone that there was no, there was no additional parking allowed in the loop, only, only those three spots. So there couldn't be the gridlock and, and the backup that we had before. Um, it's been, it's worked very well. And so this experiment was a, a success, and uh, now we're we're hoping we can take the next step. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Michael um, and David. Uh, I have a couple of questions um, about the design of the parking, and it would be helpful to see that uh, a plan that you have um, you proposed that shows the diagonal parking. The, um, or the... um, yeah, Sarah, Sarah might be able to do it more easily. Do, can you do? You, can you access it, Sarah? So one on page six of the letter, oh. I remember. Yeah, and then I, think... I can ask the questions while Sarah's getting that up okay. and running. Is, can Can you do that, Sarah? Uh, I can. Yeah, give Give me just a minute, or you can. Okay. Yeah. Six. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one of the questions I had is whether you had talked with Smith at all about sharing the driveway with them. And the reason I'm saying that is, um, you know, if you were able to share a driveway with them that they use for the museum, um, you could flip the parking and put it um, away from the building. And so you would give some breath to some green space um, back to the building setting oh my and God. keep the yes. great vehicles yes. out. You're absolutely right. It, that would be a, a wonderful option. Um, but um, we we haven't been allowed to to do that. They use that apparently. They use that quite a bit. Uh, they don't okay. want it. so. Unfortunately, that hasn't been a, an option for us. But I'm not talking about parking in their driveway. I'm talking about oh, sharing the driveway's access to a parking area that would be oh, you know, okay. more. See what I'm saying? What kind of where the tent is? Yeah. Okay. So parking over on that side. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, that's, that's one thought. Certainly a possibility, right? It would require, um, it might require that they back out uh, into the street. I'm not sure. Well, so that's another question I have about the way these diagonal spaces are designed, and I, I didn't have a chance to look at the Northampton um, parking regulations. And Sarah, I'm ho hoping you know this off the top of your head, what the dimensional requirements are for parking spaces. Are they really that big? It's certainly possible, but um, that is big. Um, that the, you know, when you have diet, the, the way that parking is, the way you've shown it here, people are going to be coming in at a diagonal and then they're going to have to, you know, back out in the opposite direction that you would think. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're turning at more than a 90 degree angle to get out of there and get out into the. Um, yeah, and this is what they've been doing now. And seems to be okay. Uh, we, this is this is one of the reasons why I said this is an experiment. We wanted to see if this could possibly work um, before we requested permission to to pave. And um, the uh, feedback we've gotten has been really positive. And and my observations are that people understand how to back out 
and then go forward around the, the circle and then out uh, at the top. So you're not concerned about people who are parking the spaces that are closer to the building. So the left, and this, in this image, this, it's the spaces that, that are to the left, the two spaces to the left, you know, they essentially yeah. Yeah, um, they have to take it back all the way out. Um, they, well, they have to back out uh, so that they can go around the circle. You're right. right. And yeah. you're not worried about conflicts with pedestrians or other vehicles or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, it's you've been doing it for about eleven months now, mm -hmm. and you've had so much uh, better performance. And so so many before we had a lot of conflicts when we had the, the gridlock and the, and the circular semicircular driveway. But uh, I'm not aware of any problems at all so far in eleven okay. months. Okay. Okay. And the, the so, parking space standards are eight and a half feet in width and 18 feet in length. Yeah, and is that true for, it's true for diagonal as well? Uh, yes, so just eight and a half yes. width okay. and then shifted. Right. Um, so you're, you've got some big space. I mean, these spaces are bigger than they need to be. So I'm saying I'm looking at ways to try to um, right. minimize the amount of impervious surface. Yeah. So. Um, if you look on page five of this document, mm -hmm. uh, um, we ran around and looked at some of the existing angle parking, and uh, we just we picked five in, in the in the area and measured widths, lengths, and angles on them. And um, there were some that were shorter and narrower, no question. Uh, mm -hmm. The Smith College Bedford Terrace spot was a lot. Um, so we just picked a, a median value, but certainly we could go with something smaller. I mean, the, you know, the, zone, the Northampton, um, Northampton establishes its parking dimension retention requirements, um, you know, based on a lot of information. It's and, and I don't know what these folks here have done. Um, I know some of these lots of brown have probably been here a long time and they evolved organically. Right. Um, but I would encourage you to go and use what Northampton supplies okay. um, and, and not make the spaces bigger than they need to be. So yeah, what's, the, what's the, um, was there a, a length, width, and angle for um, angle parking? Uh, it doesn't provide the angle for angle parking, but it has eight and a half feet width, 18 feet length. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's going to minimize it a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So the other question I have, and I think Michael raised this, is I, I drove by there at like 10, 15 this morning to go downtown to a meeting, and that area was all full of cars. So at that hour, who was parking there? 10, 15 this morning? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we, we're serve, we serve on Mondays uh, food, and so that starts at 1130. Uh, we also have the um, community center operating, too. Uh, so... Okay. Any one of a number of folks. Um, we, you know, we, there are days when we have I don't know how many people, but uh, huge numbers inside the church uh, on a, you know, almost every day except Friday. And so you don't have a lot of on-site parking. Where do people? If you have all these people coming, where do they park now? That's a good question. Uh, I think um, there's a lot of in and out uh, in our lot, and so many of them do park there. A lot of the guests walk in or ride their bike bikes, um, so we have that option as well. But there are enough a substantial number who have cars and, and are living far enough away, and they drive their cars in. And of course, those who are delivering food too. Okay, and then the other question is: there, um, Barbara alluded to this. Um, do we know when the resiliency center is going to be operating? Any idea? The latest I've heard, and, and Sarah, you might have a much better clearer picture, is uh, that it's probably not going to be fully operational until twenty twenty seven. Um, and um, one of the things that we're wrestling with right now is uh, we don't know what will happen at that point. Uh, we're not, it's not clear that MANA will be uh, the contractor. Uh, we, you know, we have to apply for that, um, to play that role. Uh, we're also hosting HCHC, uh, Hilltown Collaborative Health Center, too. Uh, I, I suspect they will be involved with um, the, uh, the full resilience hub 
Well, we can't be sure. And and I, I also have to go back and recognize that St. John, since 1985, has had this ministry. Uh, we created MANA, and I, from talking to the St. John's board and leadership, I know they want to continue to serve the, the um, needy population of Northampton in ways that um, they can. Um, so this has been a, a long-term, also a long-term uh, ministry of St. John's uh, to the community, mm -hmm. partly on our location. Yeah, okay. Those are great answers. Can um, I just something? Yeah, it's, Barbara, please. It's, um, I just hope that um, the city sort of is taking lessons from this as to what the needs are for access in with parking spaces for people either bringing food to a place or doing stuff because i know the the current location the the old baptist church has very limited parking if you know who knows what the parking um plans are um it seemed like an odd site for me because of that so i just hope that the city is rethinking that or just considering what the issues are and maybe talk to st john's about maybe you've said, said something to the city already but if you haven't I think it would be a good conversation to have as the planning goes forward for the city's resiliency center. Yeah, quite well taken. <laughs> and just to uh, dovetail on that, um, you know, we do know we do know that if the plans for Main Street go forward, uh, there are going to be a diminished number of spaces on Main Street. I'm assuming, assuming that some of the people that uh, come to uh, the MANA program and others probably park on Main Street, um, and that is going to be limited. Uh, so it's putting more demand on other parts of the city, and I would think, imagine, including your site as well. Um, so it's just, um, yeah, it's a complex, complex problem. Can Anybody I? Anybody have um, any other? Michael. Yeah. Um, so as I was thinking about the reduction from 10.5 to 8.2, if there are six spaces that are being trimmed down, I wonder if that might free up another space and make it seven instead of six. I mean, given the need, I, and, and obviously we don't we don't want to pave paradise, right? So I'm not trying to say more parking is always better, but it the, seems that the need is significant. And so if you went from 10.5 to 8.5, would it be possible to add another space? Well, it might be if there. We we currently are are um, planning on five, and so if that's going to save us uh, ten feet, you would think that that would be. Oh, you were planning on five. I'm sorry, I had it wrong. I was thinking six, but yeah, so maybe six instead of five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, something we we hadn't thought about. We, we're focusing on five. That's what we've been. Yeah. That's how we've been operating, more or less, up to this yeah. point. I don't know. Does that change anything, Sarah? Going from five to six. And I know there was some issue around five spaces, and uh, there was a different six brought us into a different category. I think. Yeah. Let me just check the the zoning. That might have that might trigger a, a permit, even though it otherwise wouldn't. Um, uh, are there any other comments from commissioners? Um, would anyone uh, from the general public want to say anything? Is it Catherine? Catherine, yes. Um, historian Please involved. Get your here. name and yeah, Catherine your name Lindberg. and your, Catherine Lindbergh, 10 year member at St. John's in our 200 year history, actually since 1826, thanks to Cogswell and um, Bancroft of the Round Hill School. That's my connection to Janet at the beginning. Those were the founding members in 1826. The building is newer. The building's just since 1892. So we do have 60 some years before that in town. And um, Thank you for um, giving lovely consideration to this. Um, I'm a parker there, and I have never found a space in the new diagonal arrangement. I rarely find a space in the semicircle. I have driven around for a half hour at a time to find a place to volunteer during the week. 
So thank you. And um, uh, Martha, I'll just note that, just if, note that if, if the commission, um, if the commission allowed six spaces that could be possible under zoning, but would require site plan approval. I don't think that would be a bad idea personally, but <laughs> the number of spaces or the site plan approval. <laughs> Okay, um, any other questions or comments? If not, um, I entertain a motion um, to issue a certificate of, well, like, are we doing appropriateness or hardship here, right? Because hardship is, um, was a question. So if, you if ask the yeah, so if the commission finds that uh, a certificate of appropriateness would not be appropriate in this case um, because the work wouldn't meet the design standards, then you would then consider whether a certificate of hardship okay. uh, might be appropriate. Okay. Does anyone want to make a motion? <laughs> Someone. Whoops, I can unmute myself. Um, I uh, move that the commission I think we, in this case, because of the design standards, we should issue a, um, is it a, called a certificate of hardship to um, uh, allow for, and we'll say five to six space angle parking spaces um, in the designated area shown on the plans for St. John. And this isn't necessarily part of the motion, but then you could decide if you wanna go ahead with six and then, um, which as Sarah said, would require site plan approval. But we would approve let's let's say up to six spaces and and barbara did you want to include something about screening right we, okay we could say that we want um some uh more permanent screening that the not that you we would we love the idea of your snacking garden there but something in addition to that to uh screen the parking from from the street mm -hmm. thank, thank you michael Is that clear, Sarah? Yes. Um, does anyone want to second that? I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion? I would just like to um, make clear that this is really outside of our guidelines. Um, this is a very unusual situation. We would not normally do this kind of thing because it does really have a, you know, pretty, um, conflicting, I guess, effect on the aesthetics of that property. Um, but given the community need and what St. John means to so many people, I think um, a hardship, a certificate would be okay. So, okay. If anybody, no more comments, I'm happy to um, move it to vote. All right, so roll call vote on a certificate of hardship. Barbara? Yes. Michael? Yes. Dylan? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Okay, so the final uh, public hearing is for a request also in the local historic district, a certificate of previous privateness pursuant to section 195 of the Northampton Code for a placement of 65 windows um, this is uh, at 3 Elm Street, the former St. Mary's Rectory Building, parcel 31D-103, and it's Shaw Perry Summary Builders that are presenting this. Um, and I do have information on the window uh, guidelines as well, which probably everyone has looked at. They're much more uh, elaborate. But in the meantime, um, Mr. Perry, if you're here and you would like to present or um, discuss the project with it, we'd be happy to hear that. I'm Dimitri Robinson. This is Shaw sitting right next to me. And we're going to present together, if that's OK. That's great. OK. Um, <clears throat> as you may be aware, uh, Sunwood Development purchased Three Elm Street, St. Mary's Church and Rectory. And we intend to develop it. Uh, primarily, we're, we're going to build a uh, large multifamily apartment building 
um, where there is currently a parking lot on State Street. We have uh, long-term plans to restore and renovate the church and preserve it as some kind of community facing event space. But that's our third priority. Our first priority though, is to get the rectory renovated and converted into a uh, short-term rental business that can generate re revenue to help drive the other priorities. Uh, we learned early on when we got into the rectory that there was a lot of asbestos and we did a, lot, a fair amount of abatement in the insides, removing drywall. Uh, we discovered that there was asbestos in the caulking of the windows. The windows are also quite old and some of them are in a uh, state of disrepair. And we determined that economically it, it would be extremely difficult to remove, abate the asbestos and restore the windows as they are. And so we're proposing to uh, put a, a modern uh, energy efficient uh, window in and replace all of them with with with, uh, with this new window. And it's... <clears throat> Sorry, okay. that's, that's basically my introduction. <laughs> right. Um, so I uh, I think that we could use a little more information on the specifics of the windows themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, a... I do have some additional photos that I can just right. screen. Right. That'd be perfect. Um, yeah. We did receive a lot of information from Pella, but it was a little. Um, yeah, it was a little dense. Yeah. I wanted to, yeah, yeah that, that was my goal today was to sort of, sort of clarify a little bit. Great. So Perfect. let's see. This will be the first time I've ever shared a screen on a Zoom hmm. call, but I'm sure it's. I'm sure you'll do great. All right. Here we go. Um, so I would like to show you this. So can you see that? Not yet. Oh, huh. okay. And I'm not sure how to do that. Um, oh, I see. Take your time. Got it. It's, uh, okay. We're getting there. Oh, yeah. yes. There we are. Great. Okay. So that's, and can you see my mouse here moving? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that is clearly one of the existing windows. And this is typical. They mostly look like this. Um, most of them actually have a, um, a uh, aluminum screen, a, a, an aluminum screen, and uh, storm window on them. This one doesn't. It's on the, on the ground level at the back. Uh, this on the right is a sample that was provided by our rep of the line of window that we want to use. I want to point out right off the bat that it is not going to be a four over one like configuration. It'll be a two over two, and. Um, I can let's see if I can. So this is actually the proposal from Pella showing the various windows, and they're all, as you can see, in a two over two mm -hmm. configuration to match the existing windows. Um, I need to let me just maneuver this a little bit here. Huh, I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. So one of the things we were trying to do, I'm reading the guidelines, is to preserve the visible light. <clears throat> and so we took some measurements and you can see that on the, on the sides of the windows, there's two and five eighths inches of space between the glass and the brick. Mm -hmm. And on the proposed new window, there's also Two and five eighths inches of space between the glass and the brick. On the bottom, there's a little bit more room on the existing windows. Uh, but we're proposing that we'll add uh, on the bottom of, of this window a, uh, it's a nosing that I can actually show you here if I can get there. Actually, the nosing is somewhere else. I'm going to have to change apps. So, how do I do that? You should be able to hit the little arrow next to share or hit the button itself and be able to select something different. 
Oh, I see. Um, let me not just dock it to the bottom. Um, new share, maybe. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this, I'll do my best to illustrate this here. Um, so the window, the proposed window, as as shown in the prior picture, basically this is the bottom of it right here. Mm -hmm. And this piece here, this uh this sill nose is made by Pella, and we can add that to the bottom of the window and then you know raise the window up this distance here with a piece of you know, of wood. So the window will sit on that piece of wood and have this nosing, and that'll add with the slope one and three eighths inches to the height of the window. And that will more or less match the distance from the sill to the bottom of the glass once we do that. Mm -hmm. um, let me go back to my other. Okay, that's Can I, can I just ask real quickly? So sure. the idea of doing that is to match the existing windows, but there's no structural reason to do that. That's right. That's right. It was our understanding that that might be desirable to keep the amount of visible light consistent. And okay. so that's, honestly, it's an extra bit of work. If it's not necessary, and we could have more light, it might be preferable not to do that, but we're proposing that because we understood that that might be something that would be desired by the commission. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to my other. There we go. I also wanted to point out the, uh, so this is the upper sash, and the lower sash and in the bottom of the upper sash is about one and one eighth inch on the existing windows. It's approximately, it's, it's exactly one inch on the proposed new window. The Munton is seven eighths on both windows. Uh, the, oh, sorry, did you have a question? Nope, I was, that was a question I was gonna ask you. Okay. So, anyway, yeah. The divided light, Pella provides different options for that. And we are choosing the center option. So it's simulated divided light with a spacer between the glass as well. And I wanted to also point out that the, uh, the top of the window, I don't have a picture to illustrate it, but the top of the window also, we were proposing to add approximately three quarter inch of, um, of, of spacing to match the amount of visible light. But again, if that's not required, it would be better to just put the, you know, get the window to the exact size and install it right to the brick. Yeah, I wondered about the integrity, uh, not um, historical integrity, but the, just longevity of um, making these accommodations, you know, adding material, essentially wood in this case, to uh, replicate, you know, what was there. Um, you know, the longevity of that is that going to create? I don't know. It seems like more what places for water to get in when I look at it. <laughs> I'm sure that wouldn't happen, but do you understand what I'm saying? It just Absolutely. It seems like so it would be simpler to, speak to that. So maybe I'll just step one back, one step backwards for one moment and say that today we're coming before you just to get permission to replace the window one for one. The windows that we're looking at are just inserted into the brick opening and we're looking to replace that with the same size windows fitting into the same opening in the same manner. Right. So uh, the windows are gonna be custom made to fit those openings. And uh, those are, you probably already noticed, but they're uh, aluminum clad Pella windows, the, the double in, double glass and, and, and insulated. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in reference to the sill, the sill is a Pella applied sill that we can get. So it wouldn't be taking away from the quality or longevity of the installation. It may be a little cleaner without it, mm -hmm. being that it's an add-on piece to an existing window, but it's a it's an integral part of Pella offerings for that window. So if we wanted to eliminate any add-ons, I would take the first thing I would do is eliminate the top add-on because that was going to be something that we would have to do in the field not to, or because Pella doesn't offer it. Mm -hmm. hey, can I ask a question before you leave these pictures? We're obviously on the Pella window, we're seeing the inside of the window. It, what you'd see if you're standing inside the building, I think. Well, this is the outside of the window. What, what is the little, it looks like there's a, a piece at the bottom, which looks, what is that metal piece there? That's a, that's a, a handle to lift and remove the screen. So I mean, so these would have exterior screens. Yes, the screens are on the are mounted on the outside. The clips are inside the screen, so you would, you know, undo the clips from the inside. But the screens are on the outside. Yes. Okay. Um. So you're saying I'm seeing the outside of the window here. Okay. Um. Yes. And the other question I had was, if you could go back to the page that showed the grill options or that. The question is, is there a grill or a mutton or, or sort of on both sides of the window? Yes, let me go back or to just that. on one side of the window. No, it's on both sides. Let me find yeah, the it. space of bar in the middle. Um oh, it's actually yeah. sorry. And this may also be obvious that you're showing us a sample, but that so you're saying so there is a grill on both sides and then there's a spacer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, here, yeah. it'll it's up in the load. And so, then, yeah, the center yeah. one has okay. the, I think the left is the exterior, and then there's a spacer between the glass, right. and then on the right is the interior. Okay, and it just doesn't mean anything that that's, like, not shown as black. You know, like it doesn't look the same as the other side. I don't know if I'm making my question clear. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Yeah, I'm just not sure why they don't seem to have the same profile. No, they have the same uh, width, but they do have a different profile. You're right. Right. The ones on the inside are a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper, right. Okay. And what is the reason for that? Yeah, that's, uh, that would be my um, question. Is it because of the screen? Um, the inside is beefier because it's a solid piece of wood. The mm -hmm. exterior is a piece of aluminum, so they can make it smaller. It's thinner. Mm -hmm. They're both seven eighths of an inch, but the wood is a little more substantial on the inside. Mm -hmm. And if I that's I'm answering the question. Yeah, and yeah. I think and, and even right though here. what you're I'm sorry, even though what you're showing us is black, the window, they would match yeah. the current color, they would be brown. Oh, well, that was not our- Are you proposing making the black? That was not our intention. We were intending to use the black color. Okay. Um, I think there was another question. Okay, can we go back to the picture of where we're, where we're seeing the, you know, the existing window and then the window next to it, the, the your proposal window? Because when the screen is in there, you still see that little clip or whatever that is at the bottom. I forget how you described it, that little yep. rectangle. Yes. Okay. Because I must tell you that that really bothers me, <laughs> um, just visually. Yeah. Um, and, like you know, I've seen other windows that have a, a you know, I have windows like even at my house, I have a, a clip in, you know, a screen like that, and you just, pull the sides, the little pieces at the side, you don't need a separate thing. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The The other question is, I mean, we're talking about the look of, of your new windows, but I think we haven't talked about, I, I'm, um, I feel I really need more information about a really like a survey of the existing windows to know what kind of shape they're in. Now, and the caulk that you're describing 
on is that on each window that there is asbestos in in that caulking and is that just around the frame where or the or is the caulking what where is the caulking that has the um asbestos okay i'm going to just repeat that to shaw and then he's going to answer okay. she's asking uh, for more detail about the determination that there's asbestos in the caulking and it, whether it's on all the caulking or the windows yeah Oh, that's a great question. So uh, the first steps in um, getting permits to do any work would have to be um, testing for asbestos. And so we hired this company, actually, it's a local company that does asbestos testing. They did um, a complete test across all the products in the whole building. And we can absolutely supply you with a copy of it. It's multiple pages. That includes, I think, um, 180 samples uh, that they've taken off the building. And on the interior, there's a variety of different services that had some minimal asbestos in them, and they have all been uh, removed already. But on the exterior, all the windows are caulked. The wood mm -hmm. of the window is caulked into the brick with caulking that had residue of asbestos in it. And all the putty around the, each pane of glass has c contamination. So they would have to uh, remove the sash because of the contamination of the putty that's holding the glass and then remove the windows and then clean meticulously the caulking on the brick after the window is removed because the caulking is between the existing condition and the brick. So they have to remove the window, clean all the caulking off the brick, and in a way sort of meticulous chip it away. You're not allowed, I believe, to use a grinder. And then it would be the option that for us to install the new window. And uh, is that kind of meticulous removal of caulking, is that dangerous to the workers? Yeah, absolutely. So that is all have to do with the code and regulations for asbestos removal. So they will create an, you know, a vacuum and filter of the air. All the workers are um, not only experienced and they're uh, protected. And that's all done by a qualified uh, remove asbestos removal company. We bid the job and they're awaiting approval to move forward with the removal. Mm -hmm. After the removal, there is another third party company that comes and tests the integrity of the work before we can do anything. Okay. And, and uh, just a question about energy efficiency of, of doing going with that option versus the Pella windows is is there any comparison there in other words if you were to go with essentially reef renovating the existing windows removing the uh by removing the asbestos and and reglazing them versus the option of going with the Pella, the comparison between the two as far as energy efficiency would be what? Yeah. Would, so, would they essentially um, end up the same the same or would they be different? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. The the existing conditions I think would fail the bare minimum of quality. And we were thinking about it today. These windows are more than likely over a hundred years old. So to the degree that they've given uh, the building incredible service over the years. But going forward and thinking about today's standards, particularly in a town like Northampton, that we strive for you know, net zero and better, the quality of the windows is one of the main elements of energy efficiency. The new windows that we're looking to use are you know, medium, quality in terms of the Pella line, you know, the one other uh, energy level uh, that's higher than this would be a triple glazed window. But the reality is that the 
building itself would be so difficult to bring to that kind of level of energy efficiency. So I would imagine that the double glazed window with the caulking and the installation that we're going to follow would be a huge improvement. And in fact, it would be you know, a most basic requirement for um, a new interior with, uh, you know, we're talking about all electric building that's as energy efficient as we can possibly do. Mm -hmm. I have another question while we're looking at this window here. So this is obviously showing it with the screen in place. You know, I'm seeing a grid of a screen. So, um, which it's a shame you don't have a, well, I think in your, in your packet, we saw the existing, you know, combination storm and screens that are on the building now. But I feel like, and again, maybe this is just not a good picture of them. It's, it's again, a very distracting pattern, it, which really seems to, I, I can well, I mean, all that. screens kind of dark in the window, but I'm all, but I'm also wondering, is your glass going to be clear? Or cause a lot of sometimes low E or I forget what the designation is for, for glass. Sometimes it has a tint to it. And I think we wouldn't want it to have any kind of tint, you know, so as to preserve. This the, glass doesn't have clear a tint, glass. but I have, to, I have to admit the photograph, what you're seeing that all that, that screen image. I yeah. think that that's an artifact of my iPhone okay. camera. <laughs> taking with an angled, angled sunlight, catching the okay. screen. Okay. I mean, I'm looking at the window across the room here. I can bring it over if you'd like, and it looks, <laughs> it doesn't look like that. Okay, all right. Well, that's, yeah. thanks for I mean, I'll, I'm gonna grab it yeah. just to show you. Yeah, <laughs> it just seems very odd to that it would be yeah. such a, mm -hmm. such a prominent uh, feature of, of the look. Well, we'll have to. I don't know whether this is going to be any better. It's like, I, I can't yeah. really see the screen. It's just, you know, I, I see yeah. a reflection and that's kind yeah. of about it. I mean, it looks it looks like a window behind a screen, but the screen- Right, right. Show. But the screen is, the doesn't screen. really look like this. Okay. Like you're seeing on this photograph. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad I asked the question. So you told me this was just, a, you know, a, a phone photo of, of, of the window. <clears throat> Uh, um, Dylan, do you have any questions? Or was that you, Michael, who had more question? I, no. I have one more question, but okay. Dylan, go ahead. No, you all are asking great questions. You go ahead, Michael. I don't have anything to add. Uh, my only other question has to do with, um, this is a mid-grade window, um, and I was wondering about soundproofing, not because that has anything to do with what we as the Historical Commission can uh, use in our assessment, but I was just wondering, you know, like soundproofing in that location seems like an important uh, issue. And I was wondering if that's been considered in the window selection. So I would say that it's a mid-grade window only in the fact that it's an, an energy efficiency because it's not a triple glaze windows. And if it was new construction, which we do all the time, we use triple glaze Palo windows that are actually exactly the same as this window. And in terms of sound, uh, it is, it's a great window that provides um, a great sound abatement. And yeah, uh, um, we feel very comfortable. It, you know, compared to most of the windows that you see installed on the market, like vinyl or aluminum windows, this is a superior window. It's just that in terms of the line of Pella, they have windows that are, you know, high level, not so much in terms of air infiltration, but in um, just the triple glaze glass. Okay. Thank you. So the screens, um, do they typically come off in the winter? Would you, would you as a landlord remove them or just keep them in place? I'm just wondering. The screens in the winter. Probably not. Yeah, probably, probably not. not. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, like Barbara, I have probably windows in my house and we don't take the screens out in the winter. It's too much trouble. Um, okay. Can I ask one other question, Martha? Sorry, with yeah. the, and, uh, what was I saying? So these are double hung windows, but does the, 
can you lower the window from the top or just can you lower the top window down or just the bottom window up? Yes. You can lower lower the top or raise the bottom. Yes. Okay, so you can do either one. Okay, good. All right. So you would need a full screen, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um I would ask if there are any members of the public who would like to comment on this. Uh and that the other members of the public are maybe not here. So, um, but I'll say it. Is there anyone in the public that I can't see on the screen here who wants to comment or ask a question? Okay. So um, I think at this point we have um, all the information that we need and um, I would entertain a motion and this is to um, award a certificate of appropriate and I will say, given the um, guidelines uh, for replacement, I do do see that you know you've taken care to see, see that you meet uh, those, which is really something that is not always easy to achieve. So that's good. Um, anyway, would someone like to make a motion? Well, I, I would make a motion to issue a certificate of appropriateness. Um, and this may be controversial, but I don't think there should be a requirement to build out the top and bottom of the windows. I think more lights better. Um, so I would just issue it without any restriction as far as that's concerned. Anyone want to second that? I would agree with Michael. I think that's right. Sure, we I'll second. To... Okay. Um, unless there's any other discussion, uh, we will like, take a vote. Uh, Barbara? Say, probably, yeah, you've probably been able to tell that I'm not real. It's, I'm not real happy with these. I know you said that it's it's a pretty good match, but there are certain details on it that really kind of bother me. Um, um, and I know you were saying you, you have to remove every window in the building to remove the caulking the asbestos in the caulking or with the caulking with the asbestos and then you'd have to reglaze every window the the um you know the guidelines our design guidelines or maybe it's even the secretary of the interior guidelines also really prefer strongly prefer reuse of original materials when possible and i i don't know if a further study of the windows is necessary because you're saying every window um, you're you're assuming at least that every window has this problem, so I'm just not totally comfortable. I I just don't think, and it, part of it may be you should have given us a window that didn't have a four over one, but I'm trying to overlook that. Um, it just and I've seen your measurements, um, but uh, I actually happen to prefer the brown with the brick. I just think it's more aesthetically pleasing and. Um, uh, <laughs> So I just don't feel totally comfortable with this. Let me ask Shaw a question. Are there alternative colors that we could select from? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are other colors. So the primary color on the exterior of the building is the aluminum screen that is existing at this time. We thought that the black would look clean and look uh, good with the uh with a brick and yeah i mean color is not something that we can really weigh in on um right we could weigh in on if you're using colored glass you're not doing that so i think um i would reserve judgment about color uh looking what at what is intended for not only the building but also its setting and see how um, all of this works together. I mean, I think this, this this photo comparison is a little misleading because one, we don't have the screening on the historic window. And two, um, the size is, does not look exactly the same. It's hard to see it. I mean, it'd be great to see that proposed window inserted into one of these um, fenestration holes, um, but, yeah, I mean, those are pretty bad. Are you able to uh, see this image that I've just put up? Yeah, yep, yeah, we can see it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, really what you see in this image is the aluminum frame. Yeah. Oh, it just, it's glaring at you. Here there's some wooden screens on the bottom. And are these actually brown? They look black in this photo. Uh, I believe they're also brown and some of them are just faded. It's just a low light. Oh, or they're dirty or something. Yeah. yeah okay. This yeah, one looks this like one. it's black. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, we do have a motion. It needs to be seconded. And Barbara, you, I, I think, think you're one did second it. I did. did okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think we should vote. And Barbara, you, you do not have to support the application. You know, if you feel so strongly about it, please register as you wish. Is everyone comfortable with voting? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So Sarah, we need to take a vote. All right, uh, so roll call vote. Barbara? I'm gonna move Stain. Uh, Michael? Yes. Dylan? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Uh, it's motion fails because it's not a majority of the commission. Oh, I thought it had well. Wait a minute. What do you mean? This so that, that's, only, that's only three. Right. I mean, even if we have vacancies, so we'd have to have four. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Hmm. Hmm. So where does that leave us? <laughs> yeah, where does that leave us? Uh, good question. Um, Could make I more guess, motions. I guess Barbara, we'd like to hear more from you, like maybe what you, <laughs> what what you think it would take to to get over the line. Oh, sorry, I don't. You know, as I said, I mean, we um, we didn't hear. I mean, we know it would be much more involved. I would assume to restore each window, but we didn't really get a, um, a pricing, a, a comparison pricing, which might then let us give you, if that were much more, so much more expensive for your project, it might lead us to say we were gonna give you a certificate of hardship to be able to replace um, the windows. Well, Shaw can maybe speak to it. Yeah. I'm sorry. The, the work involved in, yeah. in restoration. Um, so I mean, in in, in theory, it, it's it's an option. It's an option to remove these windows and somehow remove all the asbestos and and replace the windows. In reality, it's it's literally impossible to make it any sort of a viable alternative because. In general, we are trying to revive this 130 years old, I think, building and everything inside of it would have to be totally upgraded and updated. And I'm not even reflecting on the code because um, the energy code that we we'll have to comply with may or may not come into play in terms of the windows, but in terms of just creating a viable business that could supplement the existing of the building and bring it back to the tax fold, I think that it would be impossible for us to afford both the conditions of repairing those windows and alternatively to accommodate the heat loss and other conditions that may come along with repairing a hundred year old window. I mean, you know, more than likely, at least half of the frames or more are going to completely deteriorate into nothing as they are removed completely from the opening. Mm -hmm. And uh, the glass, probably a lot of it would be broken by the time. So it's like hardly anything would be remained. And then to go through the exercise of expending tens and thousands of dollars. I mean, let's say that the window replacement now would be a total of a $100,000 job. Uh, if it's 
double or triple that and the energy efficiency is reduced to almost non-existent, it would be impossible to sustain as a business going forward and trying to you know, make something out of the building that could survive on its own. Let me ask you one other question. That if somehow the windows were, the existing windows were repaired and replaced, you'd obviously have to put in some combination storm and screens, at least similar to the ones that are there now, if not aluminum, I mean, you have to put something there. Um, and I must say that, you know, that's not a look that I like that much. You know, I yeah. I prefer your window as proposed to having a, an aluminum storm and screen or, you know, even a dark colored storm and screen, um, which doesn't let you see as much of the window. Um, so um, so I don't know where we stand. <laughs> Let's, somebody wants to Well, that. you know, the, can... I mean, if, okay, let me put it this way. I think that, um, So it's just my point of view. I think that this building has been sitting here a long time uh, with nothing happening and it falling apart. Um, and I have watched it year after year after year. Um, and we have a, a you know, a, a person who cares about the building, has some really um, great plans for it um, to revive this space. It's an anchor of our historic district. And, um, I, I frankly was surprised that um, we weren't seeing a demolition application, honestly, um, just because it's a prime piece of real estate and this building is old and it was designed for a bunch of priests to live in. And, you know, I think it's noble what you're doing. So um, I think it, if we need, if we, I would like to see this move forward. I'm just, again, speaking for myself. Um, and if that means revising our motion, to award a certificate of hardship due to the fact that um, what's been described to us about the contamination of the windows and the um, what would be involved in doing that and it, its ability um, to affect the financial viability of this project, um, I would be in favor of that. I don't think we have to do a certificate of appropriateness. Um, you know, whenever we take out old windows and don't restore them, it always feels inappropriate to us as stewards of the historic resources of the city. Um, it, it just feels inappropriate. So, you know, maybe that would be a better motion um, to go on to make us all feel comfortable and well, to move the project forward. I would um, put forward that motion to um, have a certificate of appropriate, I mean, I'm sorry, a certificate of hardship for the project to go ahead for the reasons that you stated. And I would withdraw my motion in favor of Barbara's motion. The seconding it. Okay. Would... Um, anybody, any of the commissioners can, I, I'm just, again, I said that that was my opinion. I'm happy to have anyone else speak um, a opposing opinion about it. Um, I'm just, I'm just one person, um, so I don't want it to completely sway the boat. That's, that's where I come down on it. Well, I, I mean, Martha, I agree with you. I want to see it done, and I, I think it's, you know, having the the space um, alive and vital and occupied is 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 marvelous. So I don't know what the difference. I mean, I know what the difference between the two is, but is there any implication that I'm not thinking of by us changing it from certificate of appropriateness to certificate of hardship? The difference is really that with a certificate of hardship, uh, the commission is acknowledging that the work doesn't strictly comply either with the ordinance or the design guidelines or both, uh, but due to something unique about the application or the property, uh, that doesn't affect the district as a whole, the, the, the work can go ahead and proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just was wondering if there was anything else I needed to know, but that's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, the only other thing I would just raise is we have looked at we have looked at other window projects in the district not that long ago. Mm -hmm. 
and um, we did um, require one of the applicants to restore windows, I think, on part of their building. And then they did replacements on the other part. Um, so that would be the only um, thing I would, I think, we should be reminded of that, that there was a precedent for asking them to do that. But I don't remember the details of the condition of the windows. And there are certainly, and I don't know, Sarah, do you think that will raise a problem, be a problem? Uh, I'd have I'd have to look up the particular case, but um, there were a few instances where some of the windows supposed to be replaced were not original, and others were. So the commission right. focused on, on original versus non-original windows, or required in a case where um, entire replacement of all of the windows in the structure were proposed that that an assessment be done, and um, and I and I believe in that case focused on the windows that were in the worst condition. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, but well, neither I don't of those were, were intended to be commercial structures. Both of those were residential. Yeah. Well, I think in these in this case, I'm not sure that we could argue that, you know, cert, I mean, all the windows have the same problem. So, um, in terms of reusing them, I mean, the, true. Um, so I don't think we could. We could really say that in this case that some should be restored and then others could be replaced because you know we we would want them certainly all to look the same and i just want to say that i'm i i should have thought of this before that i might have brought forward that i'd be more comfortable with a certificate of hardship uh, uh, motion i think that's a good i think it's a really good solution and um it you know yes i think we've expressed our concern and um yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Okay. So the motion is uh, we'll issue a certificate of hardship um, for this property. And Michael, do you want your uh, caveat or concern or <laughs> about opening it up and providing more light so the dimensions aren't exactly the same? If, if Barbara would accept that as a friendly amendment, I, I just fine. don't see any, any reason to, to go to that trouble. I would agree with that. That's fine with me. Great. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, roll call vote uh, on the certificate of hardship with the um, additional condition that the the, uh, the light need not be matched. Michael. Yes. Dylan. Yes. Barbara. Yes. And Martha. Yes. Right. Unanimous. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to seeing um, this evolve. <laughs> It's been a lot of years to watch this building uh, just sit there and yeah. So we're pleased that, um, well, it's great. First of all, it's great to see you uh, here at the meeting and know who we're going to be working with um, in the coming months, years, whatever on this property. So I was, I'm great that you both showed up and um, we'll look forward to seeing the, you know, the plans as they evolve. But in the meantime, if I may just add to that, um, thank you so much for taking our, taking our request today. I also wanted to mention that at this point, our direction has been to find a use for the building that not only would get it viable, but also maintain the integrity of the building inside and out. So our plan is including on the interior is to maintain the main structure, the main staircase, the floors, and primarily try to keep the few rooms that are done very, very well with fireplaces and I'll keep them as they are. And on the interior or exterior, our plans are to maintain the exterior primarily as it is today. However, we're right now in the process of getting an architect to detail all the interior spaces. And there might be a situation that we will need to come before you again for an egress door or a change in a in the door or a change in the roof or any sort of a thing like this. I expect that primarily the building would be maintained as is, but some code issues, particularly egress might come into yeah. play that would make some changes. Also recognizing that the church is a huge thing that we we've taken as, as a, you know, part of our future. And I'm sure that there will be 
more lengthy conversations about the windows and about other details to do with renovating and trying to maintain the church and bring it back to life and to a part of the community. Yeah. Yeah, I would think access to this building is going to be an issue for you. Um, and are you going to put an elevator in here? No, that's not the plan. Not in the rectory. Okay. Yeah. Right. But just just access from the outdoors, because I don't believe there are any idea can plan access entrances at the current time. So we were thinking about the idea of trying to add an elevator as a structure exterior to the building. Yeah. But we recognize that one of the difficulties, for, for, first of all, financially to make this viable, it probably would have never met the criteria. But the idea of trying to put it in between the church, the rectory, and our new building became so difficult with the elevation change between State Street and Elm Street right. that we decided to abandon that concept. But we were thinking about that. Yeah. And in, okay. in, spite, in spite of uh, how how I, well, my comments during this meeting, I do, I do want you to know that I do appreciate your wanting to preserve as much of the historical integrity and appearance of the building as possible. Thanks, Barbara. Okay. All right. Well, um, good luck with everything. We'll be watching. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, too. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, the agenda. Um, do we have any other items on here? No. Other business. Um, we don't really have any updates on too much else other than what I said about the uh, abolition and reform district. So um, I think we'll adjourn since we're after seven and we'll be meeting again um, at the end of August. Um, Does anybody have anything else? Yeah. I have something quick. So I would just add that uh, we will plan to put forward a uh, eligibility determination for the upcoming CPA round for, yes. um, some, for historic documentation. That, that's just an initial like it is a is this legally able to be funded with CPA um, and then we can define what areas we'd like to move forward with additional documentation and the full application. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Well, everyone have a good rest, a good August. Okay. Summer's marching along. With this. And, um, and we'll see you um, at the end of the month. Yeah.